Good afternoon. This is Ben Yarbrough. I'm the CEO at Calyptic Security, and we're really excited to have you guys with us today. Uh, we're going to be uh, touching base on a lot of things we've gotten done over the last six months and, and a lot of things that we're working on. <clears throat> we're also going to uh, bring in some insights from uh, Joseph, head of our marketing and, and communities. And we also have Lawrence Teo here today. Joseph, say, say hello. Hello. How are you doing, everyone? I think I stole your slide. You did. Uh, I'm sorry about that. So this is uh, a little bit rehearsed and a little bit informal. We've also got Lawrence here today. Hello. How are you all doing? Now, we have uh, quite a bit of things to go over today, so I'm just going to make this quick right here. We're going to do a brief overview of our mission and um, talk about what we have coming down the pipe new products. Uh, going over the roadmap re review that we had previously stated from our last webinar and going forward. And um, we're going to have some surveys because we really need your feedback um, on various different things, as well as uh, version 7.0 highlights some threat alert data and partner portal updates. I want to uh, reiterate Joseph's role with us crosses quite a few things and it touches our partner portal, communication, marketing. He's been a great addition to the team. Um, and so a lot of the content you'll see is put together today by Joseph. Want to recognize him for that. And also if you guys have suggestions, he is a phenomenal conduit and executioner of, of projects. So uh, if you have ideas, let us know, bring them to Joseph and the rest of us. Happy to help. <clears throat> so first and foremost, our mission at Calyptix is to build and deliver the most advanced, complete cybersecurity solution for small and mid-sized business. That's a bold statement, but it's our mission and it's what we do. It means working hard to make things powerful, affordable, effective. And our goal is to make our partners heroes because we understand the reality for cybersecurity in the small business space is beyond challenging. You guys are working with organizations, first and foremost, are fundamental to the success of the economic well-being of our country. They employ almost half of all employees in the country. There are more than 5 million small businesses with employees, but they have limited budgets. They have limited technical resources. You guys are the gatekeepers for what they need. The firewalls that they're provided by the ISPs, frankly, they're not adequate. And many vendors are trying to shoehorn technology into small business that's not well fit, not well thought out, and it's not the right tools. You know, every screw is not a nail. We need another tool for the small business customer base, and that's what we've built. If you look at what we've done in sort of in between you guys, the requirements, what we've illustrated are all the key components to our ecosystem of the Community Shield and our partners' management of their fleet. So over the years, we've been working tirelessly to build the Access Enforcer as the platform for our Community Shield so that you can implement a custom configuration for every small business that you manage. But yet you can fold it into the power of the Community Shield leverage threat intelligence through the logs that we're able to collect and rapidly deploy the defensive measures to stop bad actors and bad traffic. With CCM, you will now be able to micromanage those sites in rapid real time, streamline configurations, see what's going on. It's really exciting what we're bringing to you guys and it's all to make you the hero. And I hope you guys understand that that's what our goal is. So when you look at what drives our development, we have to blend our mission, which is clearly stated, and most of you have been with us for more than 10 years, know well our mission. But we also have to make it very user and partner centric. That's where the feedback comes in. We can build lots of things a lot of ways, Lawrence, but usually there's one best way, right? Yeah, I mean, there's you know, one best ways, several ways, but the, the key thing that we always try to do is to listen to uh, you uh, and the partners about what you need. Um, like when we think about something new, when we're thinking about creating something new, uh, our, our first thing is not to go look at what the competitors are doing. Our, our first thing is to come to you uh, to, to see 
what do you need, uh, whether it's through the support channel or, for, or directly from Ben or from contact with sales. You know, we just want to see, yeah, what, um, you know, what the real needs are and we want to build that uh, for you and, and not, and, and we're not trying to replicate somebody else's product. We're trying to build something that's custom made for the you know, Colorbix partners. It's interesting to note some of those things can be big picture ideas, but some of those can be really small. You know, a very subtle change can make things easy for the user, which makes easy for you and makes implementation of security much easier. Yeah. So just to give an example, um, just in the past week, uh, we had a request for a feature, basically a, a new a change of Gatekeeper to make it even more user friendly uh, in the way usernames are used. Uh, so these are things that we're looking into. Um, so. Yeah, and that, um, so when requests that come in, yeah, you know, we take them into consideration and then we, yeah, you know, we try to make it happen. Yeah. So no, no, no feature request is too small or too big and we take it all seriously. We can't do it all, uh, at one time, but it's part of our journey. And the other thing that we have to blend in is the responsiveness to what's going on in the market. For instance, the adoption of, of cyber insurance. We realize that cyber insurance is driving, in many cases, the adoption of new practices, which is very powerful with our partners and our customers. And we want to make sure that we fit right in there with that. I just want to jump in here and really put a spotlight on the AE 1900. It's one of our fastest access enforcers yet. You can see the list of all the different things, the features it has, like 32 gigabytes of RAM. That's kind of crazy to have something like that. But... This is one of the shining stars of what we got going on. It's one of the workhorses of the Access Enforcer line. And it's got uh, fiber ports, is that right? It has uh, SFP ports that okay. and fiber put in there. So it's one of the most versatile that we have. We did have the 1800 that did have that as well. But this is something that's going to stay for the foreseeable future. It's a little bigger and beefier than the 8. It's so you know, much bigger and beefier. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just so that's great. And one of the one of our developers, Bryce, noted not only is it our fastest, it's our quietest. So uh, you know, it's it is a little more expensive, but those of you that have been with us a while, if you want a future proof uh in terms of speed, that's that's where we are now. In terms of upgrade path, Joseph, what are you seeing? Well, I mean, the nineteen hundred is not gonna be the kind of drop in replacement that would be on every single access enforcer that's already deployed. It is a big jump in price. But if you are looking at something from an 800 R or 800 and you're a monthly user, it, you're probably going to want to go to a 900. It's, it, it does have the speed and everything like that. But if you are annual and you, you, you are a reseller, the best bet is probably going for a 1500 because you're going to be saving in the long run anyway. And same thing goes for like any of the 1200s or 1400s where they were more powerful. If you're used to that power, go for the 1500. And of course, any of the higher end stuff, most likely the 1900 would be the best bet for you. In terms of the economics, I think Chris was saying that the 1500 three year deals pretty, that pretty is the best one. Yeah. Yeah. So it gets your effective monthly price down pretty low. So those of you that have been with us for a while that are trying to juggle the upgrade path, uh, you know, when you look at the economics, if your confidence is, is with us and you've got a long term customer, you can help use that uh, multi-year deal to keep your pricing low. So what we got here is partner deals. You can also see this inside the partner portal. If you're an admin, you can log in and see the different pricing structures we have. In this quarter, we have a monthly and a reseller deal for the AE1900 or 1500. And for the reseller, we have an AE1500 deal. So definitely log into the partner portal, check that out or call Chris directly and he'll let you know what's going on with that. And one reminder, one of the, one of the re drivers to hardware upgrades is, you know, sometimes you have to take that iPhone eight and, and move to an iPhone 13 or whatever number it's, you know, the software that the team has built and put on these appliances, uh, it's all, it's all very powerful, but you can't get the bang for the buck if you don't have the, the hardware to, to run it. So we want you guys to, to make the right investment and we are happy to work with you. <clears throat> so. Yeah, I know Chris wants us to have that sales and roadmap, but what you're here for is the uh, the good stuff, and that's the technical. So again, we're going to hit the uh, hit the highlights. Uh, much of this is reflective of our partners' input and feedback. 
But before we go to what we've done, let's talk about a few things of where we're going. So we've got a lot of interest in high availability Lawrence. And as our team has talked about it, that means a lot of different things, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. So high availability, that, that's the only loaded term. Uh, so <laughs> it means different things to different people. Oh, so that's one of the key things that we would like um, your feedback on. Like, for example, do you have a need for HA? Are you currently using HA in, with other products? And what, what, what are your specific use cases like? So in terms of what we have, um, as some of you may know, Access Enforcer is based on an operating system called OpenBSD. And OpenBSD has been around a, a long time and they've had, they, they have some great uh, HA support. Uh, there's actually a video out there uh, of OpenBSD developers showing the HA capabilities of OpenBSD where they literally take a, a hatchet and <laughs> fly stuff the network cable while you know, music was streaming, then to demonstrate that music continues going on. Like, it's uh, impressive. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, so. Well, but that infrastructure, I know I'm interrupting, I apologize, but that's a pretty complex, you know, that's hot standby, I mean, no yeah. packet loss, right? Yeah, so like that, that, that scenario that I just described where, you know, it, it's a completely seamless transfer, like where the user does not even notice any change, that's, that's what we would classify as a hot standby. Then on the other side of the spectrum is cold standby, where we, we could say is the current offline shelf sphere, where it's come, the, this, the, the backup, the secondary device is completely offline. And to get it online, you have to like, you know, connect it manually and get it going. And of course, you know, there's a spectrum. So in between hot and cold, there are you know, warm standby. And, and we were even joking during the week about a lukewarm standby. <laughs> but, it's, but, but it's all about connection loss and how much intervention is required to restore traffic. And, yeah. You know, you got to have power. You got to have another box. Yeah. You got to have a config. And that config needs to be run on the same version of software, right? So all of that has to be put in place. And obviously, it can happen a lot of different ways. And so the, on the one extreme, a hot standby, you've got multiple IPs and multiple pieces of infrastructure to, to do that. And so with, in the survey that you'll, you, you'll get a link to at the end of this, we really need your guidance because, you know, high availability of OpenBSD is totally available, but you'll lose that as it relates to the, what I would call the custom Calyptics components that we've added on that aren't sort of a standard OS default. No. Yeah, so like basically to, to implement a hot standby, we would have to make our Ecliptix components aware of the HA capability. So, yeah, so anyway. So that for web filtering, for instance, that's a Ecliptix component. So if you can tolerate dropping web traffic, you know, maybe you just need a warm standby for that, but you need a hot standby for other dedicated traffic. It's, you know, it's, but I'll tell you this, our, t our team works best when they have specific examples and needs. And, and we jump into that a lot. So the next topic that we're really investigating, and we're actually pretty far down the path, but it's it's connecting the dots between the endpoint and the network stuff, right, Lawrence? Yeah, so so as the as we deploy the Access Enforcer, Access Enforcer is great at the network level, uh, but, but we, cannot, we, we cannot see things on the endpoints side, like for example, Windows processes and you know what is issuing what like which applications creating what network connection. Uh, so by integrating with an EDR type um, client um, and basically synthesizing it with, with what we can see, then then that gives us a really comprehensive view of what's going on in the customer's environment. So we've got a quick Poll we're going to launch on this one. It's the only poll. I would appreciate a, a, a feedback here. But it's just, you know, what's the main driver for your interest in, in endpoint monitoring? Uh, when I think of endpoint monitoring, I definitely think of it in connection with, you know, the network. For me, I want to understand this outbound traffic that we're blocking with Community Shield. You know, what application is it? What user is it? Is it even a live user? Or is it a, or is it a, some kind of system component, and uh, and use that information and feedback 
to drive the expansion and refinement of the community shield. There you go. Oh, perfect. So we got 90% increase overall security. That is awesome because that's what we want to do. And we think it's the right answer. Uh, compliance, that's another very good reason that drives customer adoption. We're seeing that in a lot of the cyber policy requirements and reduction in personal, you know, all of the, the you know, most MSPs understand that, that they are a conduit to their customers. And that's a very, very good reason. And there's nothing wrong with revenue because this is going to cost a little bit more money. So that the group that checked that box, I, I admire that as well. So, you know, but it, this helps us understand. I mean, I think there are a blend of good reasons to connect the dots here. And so this, if I said this was a high priority, that would be an understatement. So uh, real excited about this effort. So, and the third item that we have that we're working on is Ecliptics Cloud Manager. So obviously the purpose here, and we're going to showcase a little bit of it today, is to get really good insight of use cases that you would need to manage uh, your fleet. And uh, Lawrence, I mean, can you think of any type of scenarios? I mean, we've got some basic configurability here. But what's a real world? I know we've got some some requests. Yeah, I mean, just uh, for those who may not be familiar with what Calytix Cloud Manager is, um, it's a central management console that you can use to manage your fleet of access enforcers. Uh, so you can do things like send a change to all of your units, um, such as uh, adding an an IP to the IP allow list or changing the web filter settings or uh, changing remote management settings, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> so we had w one partner shared recently with us that they may be changing their ISP. And so they're going to need to swap out the IP address in the remote management access uh, access control list. So that's something that would that is actually, I believe, is, is, is in the first iteration. Uh, but those are the type of use cases because we, again, Building that functionality uh, requires understanding the exact need. So the, the things that we sort of contemplated are config management, baseline comparison, and troubleshooting. But I can imagine there's a lot more. So just as a, a reminder, refresh, last year we introduced version 6.5, and that brought a new and improved integration with the Bright Cloud categorization, providing like 80 plus categories and a more than a billion domains. And it's a tremendous external resources that we added for your web filtering. And that's again, available at no charge. Um, we had added connection monitor. We implemented Zeek. Uh, we've got an update on that. We have made some multi-WAN improvements as well as added the network alerts to cover the VPN uh, connections. Uh, made a few other area improvements and the configuration restore and general reliability. As always, the release notes and the change log are publicly available in the portal. If you haven't played around with the Bright Cloud web categories, definitely encourage you to do that and talk to me about that a little bit. What's out now at 7.0, just starting to roll out and ship, is a new and improved access enforcer with a much awaited implementation of a local DNS server. We've added OpenBSD 7.3, which is the underlying operating system. And they OpenBSD puts out a new version. What is it? Every six months, yeah. like clockwork. <laughs> so it does require us to, to keep current. And why that's important is because all of the underlying packages and supporting tools, I mean, get, what's an example of the stuff that's in OpenBSD that also gets pulled current? Oh, well, the biggest I would say is the PF firewall system. Uh, and that is the underlying thing that you know, allows us to implement port forwarding, outbound filtering, and gatekeeper, you know, and geofence, and a lot. And community shield, I can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, um, and all the security enhancements we did with BSD are part of the text and poster too. So. It also positions us to make sure we can keep all the, the libraries, the underlying uh, port, on you know current as well yes. so it's uh it's a huge ecosystem and by staying current on the os we bring that benefit to the currency of you know the current you know implementation of our code we also added the code for the 1900 
And that's not a small task either, right? Yeah. So whenever we introduce a new hardware platform, we got to make sure that um, the operating system has the right drivers for it. Um, we have to make sure that our code recognizes the, the number of the, you know, the network ports on it, um, make sure the hardware sensors are working. So yeah, that's a lot of work that goes into making sure that we can uh, release a new hardware model. And as always, there continue to be improvements. Uh, after we put the bright cloud filtering in, we continue to to refine that, made some performance improvements there uh, on a, quite a few areas as well. Again, the portal has very detailed change log and, and the release notes. So Lawrence, I'm gonna let you dig in a little deeper on the on the specifics here. Yeah, so the local DNS server has been said and it's been a top request for many partners. So we're really excited that we're finally get, getting this out. Uh, so uh, so a lot of work has gone into this. Um, so with the local DNS server, uh, you can create custom DNS like A records, uh, C name and text records. Um, and you, know, you can also automatically create DNS records from your DHCP leases and reservations. Um, and, and all that is also part of our, basically the DNS logging is also part of our event fault logging. So that um, enables us to look, look for threats uh, using that feature as well. Excellent. We've got a few questions. I'm going to try to see, see what those are as we go. Um, in terms of the implementation, tell us a little bit about what we can do here. Yep. So enabling the local DNS server is really easy. Um, you just hit, uh, ch check the enable local DNS server uh, checkbox, and then you select the LAN that you want to enable it on. I check that. And then if that LAN, um, uses the AE as the DHCP server, then, you know, it's the, the, the local DNS server automatically, um, works for that LAN. Um, and then, other um, interesting things are that they can work with our LAN lockdown functionality. So what this means is that if there's a DNS request from a lockdown LAN and the lookup result is an IP in another LAN subnet, the lookup is denied. So it, uh, so the local DNS server respects the, your LAN lockdown setting on your exit enforcer. Um, other fun and, th and that's important because the attackers, I mean, they typically are trying to look lateral, right? So yeah, that's very nice. so. When, so when someone gets in the, in the network, then you know that this is hap this is critical to prevent uh, lateral movement within um, your environment. And that would also apply across VLANs. Uh, yes, I believe it does. Yeah, always love those uh, uh, unexpected questions, right, Lawrence? <laughs> the uh, I do do have a couple. Oh, oh yeah. One more, one more fun thing. Um, another request has been like the ability to create, basically enable Google safe search. Uh, this is especially important for schools, libraries, and uh, places like, um, that. So, uh, using the local DNS server, uh, is as easy as creating a, a C name record, uh, as shown on the screen. Basically, you create a C name record for a b.d.d.google.com and you point it to, uh, force safe search.google.com and you're done. You, you might do this also for like google.co.uk and others, but, uh, but the main thing is like to, to do that. Um, so, so that's, uh, with, uh, this particular implementation plus the bright cloud, I would definitely say schools should be on your radar for, for web filtering because this is now a, an extremely effective, uh, control mechanism for those kind of environments. We do have a couple of questions on DNS. I don't know, uh, the, does the local DNS server use external DNS servers? If so, what? Mm -hmm. Basically, it, it kind of basically it hands off any requests for external things to the external DNS server. Like for example, um, you know, if you're if somebody's trying to resolve, let's say Amazon.com, and obviously with the your company's the the customer side is not hosting amazon.com so it will relay that to the external DNS server get the response back and then uh relay it back to the endpoint that was requesting it perfect all right let's see i have to swap screens so the next thing we want to touch base on was ccm 
Okay, so Galilix Cloud Manager uh, is in the central management console that lets you um, push changes to your access enforcer units. Uh, right now, we're currently actively working on this. Um, and it will, the current uh, version, the current in house version allows um, <coughs> CCM to push out changes to the IP list, like a allow list, block list. The, Make basic changes to the web filter and IDS IPS, um, manage your geofence settings, uh, change remote management settings, which will be useful for the use case that Ben mentioned about when the partner change ISPs. And um, another interesting one is baseline comparisons. And we'll, we'll get into all that so, later. So, one thing to understand, and I probably most of you guys do already, but the implementation of CCNM requires orchestration at a number of different levels. So at the base level in the unit, the configurable changes are implemented through the Access Enforcer API. Then that's affected through the, the CCM client that's been built and installed to create the secure connection from the API in the box up to the cloud implementation. And then the cloud implementation has to connect to a bunch of backend stuff to pull the right information to associate it with the right partners and present that to a user. So it's, it's a lot of moving pieces. And, uh, so the, but, but it's designed to be extremely effective. And, you know, again, this is an area that we're looking for specific feedback, uh, to expand the features, uh, whether or not it be for troubleshooting or, or specific configurate configurability. So nothing's, uh, you know, you can't introduce something new without a sneak peek. So we do have a sneak peek. It is a screenshot view. Uh, we thought that would be more effective, but it, uh, will be short to have some, some more views upcoming. So right here, we have an overview of the home page. It's definitely in development right here. So take the screenshots with a grain of salt because things may change. Um, what we have here is an overview of all your access and enforcers showing serial number status, software version, and a host of different things. Um, right there. Um, we also have a color coded for online status, as you can see, a green check mark or a red exclamation point triangle. Um, we also have on the left a navigation panel that will um, allow you to select the different features um, that you can push against to any other the access enforcers. So one one thing to note is on that color coded green there on the status. You, you know, I know somebody's going to ask us, Lawrence. Well, how often does it check? Uh, constantly. <laughs> Basically, it's a, I mean, a very real time communication that's like persistent. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a pretty awesome, powerful tool. So when you think about the information you might want for troubleshooting, you know, thinking about really near instant time access to, to system information. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a cool part. Um, this was requested, uh, tags to be put onto Access Enforcer so you can organize your, uh, fleets by either a tech, account, industry, or even by configuration. And so you can sort everything and push changes to a certain amount of an Access Enforcers that have these tags. Um, I think that's one of the coolest features about it. Yeah. It, it, it gives an area of customization to it. So what is kind of not well illustrated, uh, it's not here, we'll show on another page, but there is a, a component in the CCM called the unit picker or unit selector. And so that's how you choose what unit to modify or, or so forth. And you can use the tags to basically, you know, populate your unit selector by the tags. Now we have an example here of uh, using a web filter uh, setting and pushing them out. You would select target units, select the setting, and then push apply when you have your settings made. But probably the easiest step right there. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Yeah. And here we have something where you'd be selecting a baseline unit and copying over those settings from that baseline to your target access enforcer. So you see yeah, the little star is the baseline and then if you select the function. So in this case, you hit the web filter. You select your target, compare the results, and then you hit apply to sync it. And then you'll get your results at the bottom. Yeah, so that, that could work for that IP for the remote management access. Uh, it could work for an allow list, a block list, a dynamic block list. Uh, any of those settings, you can, you know, the IDS 
IPS settings or web filter settings. You know, for me, over the years, we've got a number of folks that are using the web filtering uh, on HTTP, but not HTTPS because that component was added later. And so it's a, a quick way to see what units are not taking full advantage of the web traffic filtering so they can quickly make sure they're covered down on, on both. Yeah, and just just a reminder as well, like what the screenshots that we presented in the last few slides are in development, they may change, um, the functionality may change too. Based on your input and, you know, what we see that is needed. Yep. All right, so um, another thing to, that we, just a, this is basically a reminder of what is in the web filter, like, um, so it, the web filter is powered by Bright Cloud, um, which is an external service, a threat intelligence service that um, provides 82 categories. Um, and it has a lot of good things about it. There's, you know, it just needs a lightweight client on every X enforcer and not the full database. So, um, but the database consists of a billion, more than, actually look at it. Yeah, more than a billion domains. So it is really, really powerful. So. Um, we encourage you to take full advantage of it. And, and this is a, a, an add-on at no cost. And uh, the other piece that I would highlight, did you mention the uncategorized? Oh, no. <laughs> so, All right. How do you feel about uncategorized domains, Larry? All right. So Bright Cloud also has a, a, a thing called uncategorized domains. Basically, domains that are not has not been seen or categorized by um, Bright Cloud. And... Access to these sites tend to be you know, suspicious, malicious, you know, um, you know, or, or as our kids would you know, probably, probably say, pretty sus. <laughs> so, so, uh, so these, um, by, so Access Enforcer gives you the ability to uh, enable uh, blocking by uncategorized domains. And by doing this, you pretty much get a, a default denying type uh, policy. Which is really, really critical at uh, countering like, zero day type threats. I mean, Solar Winds, for instance, was after the research came out, quite a few organizations stopped the Solar Winds breach because they denied the outbound traffic connection attempt to pull down the malware, right? So the seed had been planted, but it didn't get to sprout because it couldn't get out. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> but, but seriously, it is a really powerful, and I tell people that, you know, you don't need to have your clients being the first customer to a website. You know, if Bright Cloud hadn't seen it, then, you know, it's worth your tech's effort to, to check it out before they allow it. So implementation of this, you may want to look at your logs and see if there's some IP specific traffic that you need, because that would be possibly uncategorized. And so you may take a little tuning, but but it's far more effective. It's it's well worth the effort. So where we're going with this in the future is we want to add the the reputation scoring. So there's also through this service the ability to rank based on a risk profile, the domains. And so then that would give you guys the ability to cut it by content and by risk profile. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. okay. Am I on the right page? I say yes. 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 Zika. All right. All right. So, uh, Zika, well, in some version 6.5, we introduced a connection monitor that is powered by Zik. Um, so for those not familiar with Zik, it's a very powerful, uh, software that, um, basically captures, um, information about every single connection that, um, that is monitoring. And it's sort of like a packet capture, but um, it is the internal format is way leaner, and it gives you just the critical information that you need. And this is used by for anything from network troubleshooting to instant response, forensics, threat hunting, and there's a whole community out there that um, they, they basically are seek users that really understand it. So it is a really powerful tool. So in uh, so this is in the X Enforcer. Uh, we activated it in 6.5 for a while to evaluate this performance and its configuration. Um, so that got us the data that we need. Um, and so 
we are trying, so right now it's disabled again, uh, to, so that we can develop the user interface, um, to, um, yeah, to build it and then, yeah, to tweak it more before we, uh, re-enable it in the future. A couple of key things that you guys will need to be able to do is, is one, select the, 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 the network that is going to be the monitored network. And then number two, set your archiving policy. So what Zeke will do for you is to establish the required immutable archive of all traffic. It will help you prove that the, tra the data never left the network if you get breached. And the, tra and the records will be there and not accessible by anybody, an adversary or otherwise. We can access it with your permission in a forensic scenario uh, on, on the disk. They're stored locally. So they don't have to be set somewhere else. It doesn't cost you more money, but you'll need to set some kind of policy, 30 day, 90 day, or, you know, amount of space on the drive. And, uh, but that, that user configurability is, is really the next critical step. What I've heard is that whenever the forensic or, or FBI guys show up and there's a breach, the first thing they want to do is what? Log everything. Mm -hmm. Well, you will already have everything. So that's, I mean, when you think about it, it's an extremely powerful tool. And then after, after we're able to do that, then that we'll be looking at the log forwarding and SIM integration. We've talked to a number of large enterprise providers that do this, but quite candidly, none of them are currently in a position to accept Zeke logs. And that's both by format and data volume and making use of the data. So it's not as simple as just, I mean, it'd be like turning literally the fire hose and it would run the bill up from a data collection and processing. So, you know, we, that's part of our investigation with our own EDR is how do we make sure that we leverage that element efficiently and economically. One more quick update, uh, Community Shield uh, nothing really new here to add other than the current status is nearly 16 million IPs uh, achieved through about 19,000 entries in the various tables. i uh, running about 20 different tables, uh, seven or eight organic ones that come from the community and about 13 or so from external sources. And it blocks again inbound and outbound traffic. And we, you're getting notifications if your traffic reaches a certain level, you'll get a malicious traffic notification for a 24 hour report. Every 30 minutes, we check for excessive outbound events or excessive outbound IPs or C2 traffic. In each of those cases, those typically are indicative of something that needs to be investigated promptly. <clears throat> yeah, well, I'll take a pause here on the warning. Uh, we've got a little bit of nitty gritty data uh, but the big picture is pretty simple. Uh, the amount of activity at your firewall on the edge continues to go up. Over the last year, our fleet, your fleets, have blocked almost 25 million unique IP addresses with geofence alone, stopping almost 6 billion probing, attacking events. And they're, you know, you may dismiss them, but based on Jan Jolrich from SANS research, blog post on the conditions of firewalls, uh, it's quite serious because there are a lot of vulnerabilities in firewalls that aren't maintained. And so they're out there trying to get in. If you reduce this to a single site, that's almost 300 unique IPs probing 15,000 times a day. So your customers probably pay $50 a month for a home alarm system that nobody ever touches their door. When you put a firewall in place, they're touching your door nonstop. So it's got to be maintained. It's got to be updated. It's got to offer you the best protection that it can. And what's interesting, and not by pointing the finger, but by using this recent scenario and just looking at the time frame and how does our data, does it show us anything? So... ConnectWise Screen Connect vulnerability was discovered supposedly on the 13th of February. After they fixed their internal stuff, they fixed, they gave you a patch for the outside stuff on the 15th. And then they gave you access if you didn't have a 
I guess, a license uh, after the 21st. So in that seven or eight day period, we saw a two to three or four times escalation in the ex, you know, the, the, the threat activity on the edge. And, you know, I'm not saying it's the cause or correlated. I'm just saying this is what happened. And so this is quite significant in my eye, but I would suggest to you that this is just an example. If you track the CISA known exploited vulnerability catalog and releases every day, I get two or three emails a day. And increasingly, they are on edge devices or externally exposed systems. So Community Shield and Geofence, they protect you even if the system is exposed because it narrows the attack surface. Again, Community Shield shrinks it by 16 million. And we see in here that Geofence stopped 25 million. So, you know, if you haven't activated Geofence, and there are a handful of you out there that haven't done it, you really need to do it. And uh, also would encourage you to use Gatekeeper because a lot of these targeted ports continue to be 3389, 80, and 443, and even SSH. And all of those are systems that can be accessed with Gatekeeper. <laughs> so why do we share this? Let's go back to our purposes to make our partners heroes. We want you to protect and secure your customers, but you have to take the action. Check and activate Geofence. It's easy. You can go to the partner portal and see, you know, what's there, right? Joseph, is that, is that feature functionality displayed? Yes. You could see that on your network sites page on the, any one of your network sites. Okay. And, and you could also see ports, right? Exposed ports. Yes. Yeah. So if there's an exposed port, it'll show you if it has an access control rule set for it. Uh, you can use Gatekeeper. You can lock down the, the system access with MFA or ACL, and that's in the portal as well. Uh, and make sure it's current. And, it, you know, if you don't have a current firewall at customer locations, whether and it's a, maybe it's a sonic wall. I think 75% of those were not current the other day. But, you know, if you guys aren't maintaining the edge devices, you might want to rethink that. Either go start updating it or get you one that's automatically updated, like an access enforcer. And again, all that you can check in the, in the portal. And if you just look at the data, guy, it, it is, it is scary. So oh, the partner, or partner portal has turned one this year. It's been a whole year since we launched the partner portal and I'm excited. I'm super excited because there's so many things that are already there and so many things we want to put in there in the future. Now, we have things that are accessible to pretty much everyone, knowledge base, you know, there's a getting started guide and everything like that. And further on, when you log in, you do have access to your network sites that we spoke of before, which will give you configuration info, uh, system and network performance, and also other things like Community Shield notifications. And if you're an admin, you have access to all the different ports and agreements and partner pricing and everything like that. So I encourage you to reach out to us if you don't already have a login at portal at and, you know, get in there. I mean, for the future, we're trying to do a little bit more for, for like enhanced reporting and uh, flexible uh, contact management, that kind of thing. And uh, we're always trying to improve the knowledge base and your feedback on this is very important. So one thing I want to share is that, you know, the portal is free, guys, to your partners. So use it. Uh, we pay for it. It's Salesforce. It's very powerful. So we can make changes very easily. Uh, they have to be properly organized, right? But in terms of information that may be available or accessible there, and then, you know, by leveraging the, the native Salesforce capability, uh, we think we can do a lot of great things with it. And we just, again, need your direction. Now, as we were talking about uh, logins, here's a brief charting of like who has access to what. Everyone has access to many different things like knowledge base, release notes, change logs, the event calendar, all the training resources, and just basically everything that you would need to know about what Calyptix is and access enforcer. When you have a tech login, then you get to start to see what's going on with your fleet, community shield notifications, you see the account and contact, as well as technical advisories. And then the admin has further uh, insight into things like uh, part pricing, 
partner deals that we spoke about before, that's in there. So, and forms policies agreements. Now, when you log in, it'll dynamically change everything on the screen for you. So one person logging in will have a different experience than another. So if you're a tech, you won't see certain things. If you're an admin, you will. But I encourage anyone who doesn't have a login to reach out to portalatclipics.com and we'll, we'll get you in. Now, here is where we like to thank a few shining stars. We have Ramtech. We have named them Partner of the Year. They have been a, a Clipix partner since 2017 and have been rock stars when it comes to, you know, deploying access to forcers. And we have a new partner of the year, RightFit IT. They signed us with in 2023 and they just hit the ground running. And really, we just wanted to put a spotlight on, on the, on these companies because more access to forces out there means more community shield protection for everyone. And you know, they have supported us throughout this time, and we just wanted to say thank you at this point. So I would also like to, to say that, you know, we don't choose our partners of the year based purely on revenues. It's how our partners and, and our best partners engage with our team, whether or not it's, it's, it's putting up with me or working with Chris and the dev team or, or support, mm. you know, and, and I, would, I will say, I mean, what y'all do is very hard. You're under the gun. And sometimes you come to us and you're under the press and, and we understand that. And sometimes I might kick back and give you a little, little pushback. And, you know, we all need to be kind and treat our people well. And, and, and our partners respond to that. And we really appreciate the, the two way feedback in building what I would call a, a true partnership because cybersecurity, it's not just, just a moneymaker. It's not just a product. It's not a fad. It's, it's protecting the foundation of our country, our small businesses. And it's very, very important that we collaborate as partners constructively to build the best, most affordable, most effective defense that we can. And you guys are at the front line and you're our heroes. Thank you. So to that, again, a heartfelt thanks. Uh, you guys, we have more than half of our partners have been with us for more than 10 years. And when we were looking at that, that was like a wow moment for me about a year ago. And it really does demonstrate to us how much faith and confidence you've put in us to build the solution that you need. So thank you very much. Now, if there's any questions, we'll, we'll field some questions here that are in the, the bin. Um, we also want to, uh, Thank you for attending the webinar. And also at the end of this webinar, you'll receive a survey, a small, very short survey. Um, please, your feedback is most valuable to us. It's not a marketing survey, by the way, guys. That, no. That's that's a development survey. Yeah. So, you know, if you want something in the box, if you want an added service, if you want an integration, you know, tell us what you need. Tell us why. Tell us sort of what it looks like and the more you can share, uh, the better. And we could, we'll circle back with you on that. So CCM is not yet available. Uh, we do not in our typical fashion have a, a time. Uh, we are using it internally, testing it. Um, so if you are interested in that, put that in the notes. I mean, if you have certain specific situations you need, I mean, we, we wouldn't mind having some folks that would like to see it, you know, and test it with some real use cases. Uh, so, uh, that, that would be helpful. You know, there's, there's definitely a lot of interest in CCM looks like. Yep. You know. <laughs> oh, it doesn't allow, oh, will CCM allow the ability to change the admin and support passwords? Not currently. Yeah, not currently. You can look into it. Uh, another, I don't know how many folks are using the, uh, MFA, but disabling a user, an MFA user across all the boxes would probably be really good. Disabling? Or no, disabling. When a tech leaves. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. That is, yeah Let me write it there. <laughs> uh, vote for that one, guys. <laughs> that's, that's one reason to use, you know, to tie those pieces together if you do the, the MFA and then we can disable that across the fleet. We don't have a URL yet, Tom. Uh, so new domains registered in the past month. I, I assume Mike may be talking about the web filtering 
Uh, my understanding is the rate of access to the uh, list is pretty fast for, for Bright Cloud. I mean, I know the last webinar we did, we had 750 million domains, and this time we had a, mi a billion. So, uh, you know, I know they pulled down the registration list as well. Uh, we do not currently have room for additional storage for Zeek. Uh, okay, great. The question is, can you add additional storage for logs using Zeek? Currently, that would not be available, but the uh, uh, that's something for us to consider. I'm assuming some kind of detachable drive or or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean the the access enforcer does ship with a large drive, but having external storage wouldn't be helpful, do I think? Um, but so, Mike, if you have any thoughts on how we would want to implement this. Uh, yeah, just, you know, I, I believe in the survey, it's like a feedback. It's a, it's a wide open comment field, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, feel free to add a comment there. If there's a particular device where you would want to store, I mean, one of the requests or has been is to keep the logs local. And the reason is if you put them somewhere else, then you've got somebody else to pay and you've got somebody else to worry about the security of those logs. So Mike is asked, what are the plans for an executive style summary report they can be generated from an AE showing security stats to reinforce the value of the access enforcer. Uh, what would probably be helpful is to look at the current report and identify specific improvements. Uh, it is possible that we've been looking at ways to push that data into the portal as well. Uh, so will MFA be included as a standard feature? Uh, that's a, a somewhat of a broad question. Uh, MFA is certainly included on the access enforcer uh, for system access, and it's uh, included with Gatekeeper uh, for that. Uh, there is a duo integration for the VPN uh, that's available as well. So, uh, Jerry, if you have more specific requests, let us know. Uh, the request is for, I think, uh, from Derek, an offline Calyptix configure, configurator. I like that. So we can set standards and push to new setups. Uh, whoops. Okay. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. Basically an offline app that they can use to like basically create a backup file that can restore a. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's neat. Great idea, Derek. Large smile. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, will the AE900 ever support SFP ports? Uh, unfortunately, no, the hardware is fixed. So you would, to get the SFP ports, you'd have to go to another, another hardware. You know, we don't, we don't build our own, uh, from scratch. We, we buy sort of semi custom units, uh, and then load them. So the 1900 is sort of the lowest end SFP supported system that we we found to date but if you if we see another we'll certainly keep that in mind i think the the request there is 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 for speed for economical speed so someone re has requested more explanation of the results from the community shield reports uh carmen i appreciate that request uh probably need a little more insight on what you're looking for so we'll reach out to you on that. Will CCM push out configs if a unit is drop shipped to a client? <laughs> auto deploy. The auto deploy is currently not available, but that's that's definitely high on the list. Yeah, it's on the radar. When you sync the web filter across multiple firewalls, will it remove the current one or add to the current one? So the current configuration in the, the web filtering is a high level enable or disable or a monitor mode for each the HTTPS and the HTTP filter. It does not get to the level of micromanaging uh, the allow list or block list or categories. That is sort of the next stage. Uh, and I my understanding is that 
the categorizations would probably be, I'm, I don't know that actually, that's, there are two different ways that that could be done. That is resetting all the categories or just adding one category at a time. And that will depend on the configuration, the API, I guess. We'll have to look at that. I think that's uh, a good question. The allow list and block list for the IPs is a per entry uh, comparison. So if you, it'll show you exactly what IPs are on or not on uh, each of the units that can they be added or removed. Okay. So there's a question here about like uh, requesting change, changes to the bright cloud categories. Or, or reporting like an uncategorized changements. But basically, the Bright Cloud is a change request page um, that can be used to submit changes directly to them, and they will investigate that and make modifications on their end. <laughs> Any comments? Uh, someone has asked, is WireGuard in the plans for a VPN client rather than the current op open VPN implementation? You just made one of the developers very happy with the push. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, I know we've talked about it. It's not uh, a, basically it's a different style VPN client, and in, in, in many, in some cases, is um, simpler. So that's that's what great. Um, <laughs> yeah, that is some. I mean, if there's a big demand for it, then yeah, it will be added to this. So if you could give us a little bit more scope and the rationale for it, Derek, that'd be great. We certainly would take that into consideration. I'd love for you also to look at the gatekeeper tool as a, as a, you know, if that could work and if not, why it's not suitable in that scenario would be great to know. Uh, let's see, IPv6 question. I have clients that are receiving IPv6 addresses. Could this be coming on Access Enforcer? We certainly talk about it uh, on a regular basis. But receiving IPv6 addresses, though, like, um, but no, I mean, it's not. I mean, the question is like, clients are receiving IPv6. Yeah, I think he's saying his customers are getting IPv6 addresses allocated to them. Oh, so we'd love to hear more about that, Dan. Where are they? What what network? Uh, and uh, you know, with, that's discuss quite candidly quite a bit from time to time uh and something that we will need to work on uh but it's it's a prioritization issue so it's not only immediate top of the list but getting insight would be very helpful i don't know if we'll have time to hit all of these and some of these may need a little follow-up so uh we did get some feedback on the community shield piece and uh you know, the challenge of trying to figure out what it is, uh, we understand that's quite difficult. And, and Graham, appreciate the, the feedback. We, if you have some scenarios, you know, we are investigating, as I mentioned, some endpoint telemetry. Uh, so if that's something that you, you want to jump on, let us know. Uh, we are actively looking at solutions there uh, to create that telemetry on the endpoint in the network. So. I think that's probably the fastest way to get the answer is a more clear incident response path and investigation. Uh, so let me know. Uh, we know that Des is asking for a comprehensive logging to external SIM service. Uh, this is definitely under consideration, Des. We need to know who the SIM provider is and what format they can ingest the data. Uh, we've worked with quite a, a few different ones uh, in our exploratory phase. I'm not sure if I know the answer to this, but I'll read the question. Are there any changes to the serial port attachment to AEs to fix the past issues with difficulty making connections? It, it, okay. I guess, I guess it's like, I mean, that's like a serial. I mean, sometimes when things get posed and you need to connect directly to the AE using a serial console, that process, I mean, it's the standard, you know, zero console type connection. Yeah. Uh, there, there are many times it worked quite well, right? And there, I, mean, I think it's just, it could be that it's like a, a I mean, the software to use, like, I mean, 
for example, Windows Hyper Terminal or <laughs> the, the, the pretty, frankly, old school type software <laughs> that needs a lot of tinkering to get it. But, but once you get it done right one time, you can use that same configuration to connect to the AE all the time. I, at least I think that's what it questions. But, um, but that, the zero port is just, you know, it's just a standard way of connecting to the AE if you need to come. Is that the same as PuTTY? Uh, you can use PuTTY to connect to it. Um, yeah. Not for SSH, but PuTTY has like a serial option too. And PuTTY would probably be easier to use in that scenario. I mean, there are sometimes when it's the system's not accessible. That's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes when it totally is and recoverable. But yeah, it's so funny. If you have any issues, bring it up to support or even call David when it comes to the, the serial connector. They'll be able to help you with that. And so I think you probably I think get that, back to her. Yeah, I think uh, we'll review the question list and uh, do our best to get back to you. And if you don't hear from us, please let us know um, if, if these are persisting in, in the feedback in the survey as well. So we've got a lot of participation today and a lot of comments, a lot of questions. Uh, and I hope you take from this session, you know, that we're listening and that we are looking to continue to improve what we're doing uh, to help you guys be the heroes for your customers. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.